Today's tale is set on the night of January 16th, 1749. The setting? The Haymarket Theatre in London's West End. Originally built in 1720, on a site formerly occupied by a pub and a gunsmith's, there was something of the little theatre who could about the place. While the Theatre Royal, Covent Garden and Drury Lane theatres put on grand operatic blockbusters, the Haymarket became well known for staging satirical pieces. Something akin to an indie movie today. These plays were often highly critical of the ruling elite. In 2022, many of these plays, penned by the likes of Henry Carey, Henry Fielding, and a man named Maggotty Johnson, seem conservative. And we are talking about Tory writers mostly, after all. These writers were trailblazers at the time. In 1688, a Dutch bloke named William basically stole the throne from the unpopular James II. The ruling class chose to look the other way as the coup happened, on the understanding the new king would give them a much freer reign than their previous guy. The move away from authoritarian rule led to a middle-class movement demanding greater rights. They advocated for property rights, representation in government, championed individualism, and demanded the rights to trade and innovate free of royal injunctions and tariffs. All very middle-class stuff now, but in 1749, this was relatively progressive stuff. The Haymarket Theatre, with its, for then, radical ideas, found plenty of willing patrons in the growing middle classes. On January 16th, 1749, the place was packed to the rafters, not for John Gay's The Beggar's Opera or Fielding's Rape Upon Rape, but for an illusionist. For weeks now, the buzz had been building around the arrival of the Bottle Conjurer. The easiest way to explain the Bottle Conjurer is to just read out the advertisement which ran in papers throughout January 1749. So here goes. At the new theatre in the Haymarket, on Monday next, the 16th, to be seen, a person who performs the several most surprising things following. First, he takes a common walking cane from any of the spectators, and thereon plays the music of every instrument now in use, and likewise sings to surprising perfection. Secondly, he presents you with a common wine bottle, which any of the spectators may first examine. This bottle is placed on a table in the middle of the stage, and he, without any equivocation, goes into it in sight of all the spectators, and sings in it. During his stay in the bottle, any person may handle it, and see plainly that it does not exceed a common tavern bottle. Those on the stage or in the boxes may come in masked habits, if agreeable to them, and the performer, if desired, will inform them who they are. So a singer and multi-instrumentalist, a mentalist with an ability to recognise you from behind the mask, and most importantly, a contortionist so skilled he could climb into a common wine bottle. How could anybody miss that? The Haymarket was abuzz with paying customers, gathered in anticipation of this wonder. They waited, first patiently, then less so. The crowd waited, in fact, for several hours, eyes affixed on an empty stage, before booing and demands for a refund finally broke the silence. Samuel Foote, the manager of the theatre, stepped out from behind the curtain and attempted to calm the angry mob. Demands for a refund rose. Someone in the crowd shouted something to the effect that they would pay double if this conjurer just climbed into a pint bottle. This comment, of all things, seemed to have been the match which lit the fuse to the crowd's sudden violent explosion. The audience rushed the stage and smashed, looted and tore up anything they could get their hands on. One angry lunatic even set a small fire off. The angry mob destroyed the Haymarket Theatre. Filing out into the street, dragging debris with them, a bonfire was set up in the streets. It was fed by the debris from the riot, 
lit by the torn down curtains. And as much as the Haymarket was popular with the middle classes, at least one aristocrat, Prince William, Duke of Cumberland, was present. The second son of King George II escaped more or less unhurt, but lost a jewel-encrusted sword in the fight. The sword has never been recovered. In the aftermath of the riot, several newspapers made light of the gullibility of the crowd. Some going as far to suggest, tongue-in-cheek, the act became a no-show after someone put a cork in the bottle, kidnapping the performer at rehearsals. Suspicion for the hoax initially fell on theatre manager Samuel Foote, who legitimately appears to have had no part in it. A mysterious, shadowy figure described only as a strange man organised the event. So who was this strange man? The best guess is John Montague, the second Duke of Montague, a bored English peer with a love of practical jokes. A trained physician and former governor of the West Indies Isles of St. Lucia and St. Vincent. He was also a philanthropist who established a foundlings hospital for abandoned children. Montague paid for the education of two prominent black Englishmen, the writer and composer Ignatius Sancho and poet Francis Williams. It's fair to say he's a complex character. For our purposes, it's worth knowing his sense of humour ran to less complex things typically dousing house guests in water and lacing their beds with itching powder. It was well known he detested the middle classes and their demands for greater freedom, and it is said that he decided to stage the bottle conjurer hoax following a night drinking with other aristocrats. He had allegedly bet his companions enough Londoners would be dumb enough to believe a fully grown adult could climb into a quart bottle. He could fill a theatre with them. The aristocracy being a law unto themselves in those days, no one ever charged the duke, who in any case died in July of that year, leaving a lesser-known mystery that is unlikely to ever be solved. 